Hi. In the second part of um, the lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of the history of child maltreatment. Now, last time I painted a pretty dim picture of how children were treated throughout history. Uh, and I want to start by saying that it, although the, um, everything I told you was true, there were some other voices and there were some other views about uh, the treatment of children, although they sometimes contradicted each other. Just to give you an example, in, uh, if we look at the United States, in the 1600s, um, the Puritans had a law that they called the Body of Liberties. And of course the Puritans were in this country at that time, and their view, uh, they had a law that prohibited parents from any, and using their own words, from any unnatural severity against children. Now this was a law that, um, in terms of what was an unnatural s severity, I don't know. It would have been, you know, their cultural values and their cultural beliefs. But what they are clearly saying is that parents can go too far. Um, the thing is, though, that parents, uh, the Puritans had kind of a dim view about children, and so they kind of offset this law by this other piece of the law, which says that this law is only applicable when the child was completely blameless. I mean, some of you might say, well, why would you blame the child? But if you know anything about Puritans, they had a pretty dim view of children. They viewed children as being born evil, and that um, parents had to, you know, break them of this evil. They were kind of, instead of like uh, the Renaissance that thought of children as being innocent, uh, the Puritans believed that children were not innocent and they were, had to be taught and broken of their evilness. So although they had this law that prevented parents from going too far, you can see that their view about children was quite different. So for example, you have this law that pro uh, prohibited parents from uh, some kind of behavior, but on the other hand, they also had a law that provided a death sentence to any child over 16 who cursed or struck their parent. So you can see that one of these seems to protect children, the other seems to not. Now there was no evidence that the Pur Puritans ever put a child to death, but the point is that they did have uh, some of the strictest views about kids. Uh, in fact, we can thank the Puritans for some of our sayings. Uh, for example, children should be seen but not heard, or the saying, spare the rod, spoil the child. Both of these sayings come from our Puritan um, ancestors, for some of us, okay? So um, there were some attempts to limit what people, uh, what parents or caretakers were able to do. And this is true throughout history, not just the United States. So it wasn't all bad throughout history. For example, um, in Carthage, Emperor Th Theodosius, uh, Theodosius was a Roman emperor of about uh, the year 395 AD, and he ordered the death penalty for anyone caught sacrificing their children. So again, a different voice in the room. Also, about the same time in Egypt, um, a woman who murdered her infant would have her breast amputated. Uh, so there was a severe punishment for, for people who in some way, uh, who killed their children. So there were, there were different laws in different parts of the world at the same time as, for example, the Romans. Okay? Um, in the uh, 13th century, Pope Innocent III found the first, uh, established the first foundling homes. Now, Pope Innocent III um, was responsible for some of the Crusades, and the Crusades left, you know, hundreds if not thousands of children uh, without their parents. And so Pope Innocent uh, established uh, what is essentially orphanages for children whose parents, um, he was probably responsible for killing. Um, and so he established these foundling homes. Now, again, by our standards today, those foundling homes were probably not very good places for children to be. But you can see that there are some other voices. Um, in the 1500s, Sir Thomas More, who was a very influential man in England, he was a, a lawyer, a philosopher, a statesman, he's a chancellor to Henry VIII, he was also a writer. Uh, so you can see he was a, a considered a, a person of, of uh, great stature, and in fact he was um, granted sainthood by the Catholic Church. So Sir Thomas More took a really dim view of abuse in, in the 1500s, 
he said in his writings, he said that he, in his writings, he only beats his daughters with peacock feathers. And so again, a different voice. The 16th and 17th century, you see further change. And you see the movement, again, that I mentioned last time about more of a child-centered. In 16th and 17th century Europe passed laws against concealing the birth of children. Now why is that important? Think about what that means. So up until the 16th and 17th century, if you had a child, you didn't have to tell anybody about it. What does that mean? If you think about it, what it means is you don't have any accountability for that child. So if I have a child and I'm able to conceal that child, in other words, I don't have to register that child, if that child disappears off the face of the earth, no one would ever know. So by having people register their children as they are born, there's the start of accountability for what happens to that child. So that's a very important step. In the 18th century, Germany outlawed infanticide. So again, you see a, a, a shift in thinking about children. And finally, in uh, the 19th century, France passed laws to protect infants who were sent out to nurse. And you may wonder what that ex exactly is about. Well, there was this practice in France. Um, during the early 19th century, mid 19th century, even late 19th century, uh, the French, um, who believed that a woman who was breastfeeding a child could not have sex, okay? So couples who wanted to resume their sexual relationships would send their, send their infant out to what was called a wet nurse. And this would be a woman in the country who would then nurse the child until a certain age and then the child would come back home. Well, as you might guess, some of these wet nurses were extremely poor women who took too many children, who were past the point where they could breastfeed children, and many infants died when they were sent out to nurse. So um, in the 19th century, France uh, finally passed a law barring this kind of um, behavior. So we see movement here. Uh, we're jumping ahead now. Back, we're back in the United States. And we see uh, the House of Refuge m movement in the US in the early 1800s. Um, at this point, um, there was a, um, we passed laws um, that protected people who could not protect themselves. So this parens patriae, it comes from, from Rome, and it is this, the obligation of the state to protect those who cannot protect themselves. So this particular thing, uh, this particular parens patriae, um, originally started in Rome as a means of um, the state stepping in when a person of wealth no longer could uh, function. And really the state was making sure that the money that that person had could be taxed and so forth and, and that the family didn't steal all the money basically. But parens patriae has now uh, sort of been thought of as being applied to children. Okay, so the, the thought that the state has to protect children. And you saw, started to see that children who were neglected or abused were removed by this House of Refuge movement using parens patriae. And so they, were, they could be removed from a neglected or abused household. But as you again may know, many of them were placed in state institutions, which were probably not much better than where they came from. But this was the first attempt by the country to counteract child abuse and neglect. And so this, this, his, this movement then took us just one step further in uh, trying to deal with child abuse and neglect. A pivotal point in our country came in 1874. And this is the case of Mary Ellen. You often hear this case mentioned as the first case that changed everything about child maltreatment. Um, but you know that's not true. Uh, as I just showed you, things were shifting. Our culture was shifting. Our community was shifting. But this case was pivotal. pivotal. Um, it really uh, got a lot of attention and a lot of press, and it changed people's views. So what I'm going to share with you is this video 
that tells you the story about Mary Ellen. And as you might guess, the pic little girl pictured on the slide is Mary Ellen, okay? So, let's see, let's see Mary Ellen's story. I'm going to go ahead just a tiny bit here. My name is Mary Ellen Wilson. I don't know how old I am. Mama whips and beats me almost every day. I never been kissed by Mama. I am never allowed to play with other children. I never dared to speak to anybody, because if I did, I would get whipped. Whenever Mama goes out, she locks me in the bedroom. I've never been outside. In 1873, Mary Ellen was discovered by a church worker who had been asked to check on the family. What Etta Wheeler found was horrifying. She was a tiny mite the size of five years, though she was then nine. From a pan set upon a low stool, she washed dishes, struggling with a frying pan about as heavy as herself. Across the table lay a brutal whip of twisted leather strands. The child's meager arms and legs bore many marks of its use. But the saddest part of her story was written on her face. The look of suppression and misery the face of a child unloved who had seen only the fearsome side of life. Mrs. Wheeler went straight to the police. They told her she must furnish proof of assault. Astonishingly, her eyewitness account of the child's scars and living conditions was not proof enough. Even though there were laws to protect a person from assault and battery, there were no laws allowing intervention inside a child's home. Mrs. Wheeler was undeterred, and casting around for some way to rescue Mary Ellen, her niece offered a useful bit of information. Children might not be protected from physical abuse, but animals were. Mrs. Wheeler petitioned the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals arguing that children were members of the animal kingdom and must therefore be protected. She persisted until Henry Berg, legal counsel and then president of the ASPCA, stepped in. Based on Berg's reputation and his connections with the court and police, Mary Ellen was finally removed from her abusive home. 
So that, there's uh, the case of Mary Ellen. Uh, the video that we just watched has a um, one myth. Um, to what degree this was a myth, we don't know, because there's conflicting reports. We do know that Henry Berg, who was the head of the SPCA, the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, was very involved in this case. And it was true that there were laws that protected animals at that time and not children. But it's not clear whether they actually raised that defense at trial. But the fact of the matter is that it was successful. It removed um, Mary Ellen from uh, her custody. By the way, Mary Ellen was living with Francis um, and Mary Connolly. Uh, Francis, uh, Mary Ellen, I'm sorry, was the Ill illegitimate daughter of uh, Mrs. Connolly's first, hu uh, first husband. So she wasn't technically related to anybody in the family. Also, what's kind of interesting about this case is the case was against uh, Mary Connolly, not the father. So even though this was a very pivotal case, the blame that was laid very squarely laid, was laid very squarely on the mother and not the father, although he had to have been present for, for uh, much of this abuse. Now, interestingly enough, is the story about Mary Ellen is told uh, in every child maltreatment book or article um, about the topic. What they often don't discuss is what happened to Mary Ellen later. So I'd like to share with you the rest of the story because I know a little bit more about what happened to her. This is Mary Ellen sometime later. After the court case, um, she was sent to a home for disturbed girls, not an orphanage, okay? And this placement was not a good placement for her, so she suffered more abuse in this institution. But interestingly enough, Etta Wheeler came to her rescue again. Um, by the way, I think we can all agree that Etta, Etta Wheeler would be considered a moral entrepreneur, okay? She worked for a, she worked for, she was a social worker for a local church and uh, she was, she's the hero of this story. So Etta Wheeler came to her rescue again. She f recognized that Mary Ellen's placement was wrong and she petitioned the judge uh, to place Mary Ellen with her own mother, Sally Engel, on a farm outside of Rochester, New York. And the judge agreed. And so Mary Ellen was moved to the farm and she lived with Sally Engel until uh, Mrs. Engel died. When Mrs. Engel, di um, Engel died, one of Etta's sisters, her, who was married, took over as uh, Etta's guardian. And as the film said, Mary Ellen lived into her 90s, and she had chil two children and took very good care of them. And by the way, uh, she named one of her children Etta, uh, one of her daughters Etta. Um, years later, one of Mary Ellen's own daughters uh, wrote to the director of the SPCC, which was founded based on this case, and asking, wanting to know more about her mother's history. So Mary Ellen lived a long and good life, uh, but it took Etta Wheeler several tries to get it right. Okay, this story gained a lot of attention and a lot of notoriety. And as the film suggested, uh, it prompted us to take another step in helping children by founding the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children. Uh, the Society advocated dramatic societal changes in the way children were treated. They are now defining a social problem, right? We have a social condition. It is a social problem. And they argued that parents should not have total authority over their children, especially when neglect or abuse occurs. And chapters of the SPCC uh, sprang up uh, pretty much all over the country. Uh, but I want to say that this is a these this SPCC was a grassroots movement. There wasn't any movement uh, from the top down. It was from the bottom up. And so in 1874, the the society was started, and it and it did take hold. But it took a lot longer to get the job done, as you'll see. So we're moving forward to the 20th century. And two social changes contributed uh, to what's called the child saving movement of the 20th century. First of all, uh, professionals took on the task of protecting children. So the SPCC was 
what you saw there was more uh, people who were volunteers or churchgoers or uh, groups of people in the community trying to save children. The child saving movement now brings in some people with a little bit more pull. So professionals started taking on the task of protecting children. So you now have, you add a new claims maker, you add a new moral entrepreneur to the call for changes. Also what happened was that women at this time were gaining more independence, for example, in the workplace. And they felt more empowered to advocate for children. So you have these two groups of people then joining the chorus, uh, the claims making that something needs to be done. However, we still didn't have any uh, federal guidelines uh, each state had a patchwork of different things, um, and still we didn't quite get where we needed to go. Until the 20th century, and especially uh, the 1960s and 70s. So finally, a recognition of child abuse as a social problem. Um, in 1962, uh, to be exact, Dr. Henry Kemp published a, an article in the Journal of the American Medal Medical Association that really kind of rocked the professional world. In his article, which was titled Battered Child Syndrome, he suggested that uh, some injuries that were being seen in emergency rooms across the United States were the result of parental abuse. And he specifically described two types of injuries that he thought was abuse. One was uh, when children, especially very young infants, come to the emergency room listless and looking like they are blacking out or whatever, uh, suffering from some kind of brain damage or brain hemorrhage. Um, what Kemp was suggesting is that these children had um, sustained their injuries because their parents shook them so violently. What we today know as shaken baby syndrome, Dr. Henry Kemp was the first to describe this as a result of parental abuse and not some natural occurrence. The other thing that Kemp argued pretty strongly for was a certain type of fracture that he saw in emergency rooms, and it's what he calls a spiral fracture. And it's hard to show you without demonstrating, but thinking, if you will, in your mind, if a child jumps up a very high place and lands, how their bone would break. It would kind of snap. Um, and th that was, that's the typical kind of bone breaking that children do all the time. What Kemp was talking about was a spiral fracture, where the bone was that actually looked like it had been twisted. And he suggested that parents had actually caused that kind of fracture when they twist a child's arm and breaking the child's bones. Now, Kemp's uh, paper was published in professional journal, but it got a lot of press as well. Um, people were uh, shocked by this, and especially physicians, they were shocked by this. In fact, Dr. Henry Kemp was nominated for, the Nobel, for a Nobel Prize for this paper. Uh, he didn't get it, but that's how groundbreaking it was. And by the way, just in case you're interested, uh, Dr. Henry Kemp, uh, practiced in Aurora, Colorado, and there is a Kemp Center down in Aurora right now that, that focuses on child maltreatment. But this was an important pivotal moment again. And then finally, um, his work resulted in laws that mandated professional uh, professionals to pr report cases of possible abuse. You see, Dr. Henry Kemp says these things are abuse and physicians will see them. And then people said we need to pass laws that make professionals report. And that's when we got CAPTA. The Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act was passed in 1974. Uh, you may ask why it took so long between 1962 and 74, but Remember, it took us 100 years to get from what, Mary Ellen to CAPTA. So things don't go fast. So let's talk about uh, CAPTA. It was, it was the crowning jewel, and this is the place we're going to stop with our history. Um, CAPTA provided some modest uh, money for uh, government research on reducing child abuse and neglect. It established 
the National Ch Center on Child Abuse. Um, it also established uh, a clearinghouse on child abuse and neglect where um, information about child abuse and neglect was gathered. And finally, they it provided grants to states for prevention and treatment of child abuse and neglect. Now, CAPTA was passed in 1974. It's still on the books, but it's changed quite a bit over the intervening years. They've changed the name of the National Center on Child Abuse. Depending on who's president at what time, it may be uh, considered a more important um, mission or a less important mission, as you might guess. But CAPTA was sort of the crown jewel uh, because finally it wasn't just the grassroots people saying we had a problem, it wasn't just the professionals saying we had a problem, it was our government saying this is a problem and coming up with a potential solution. Now CAPTA uh, also required the states do a few things as well. Um, the states had to create a register for reporting. Uh, it's often called the central registry. Uh, the state has to provide a place for people in the state to call and report child abuse. In many states, uh, there is just one registry. So there's a central number that you call to report child abuse and neglect. In other states, they have different ways. By the way, in Wyoming, there is no central registry, and it's, it's pretty haphazard, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, if you looked in the old phone books, when we still have phone books, uh, and looked under child re abuse reporting, it often told you just to call 911, which isn't really um, very good, but at least it, it, it met the standards of CAPTA, so that's what we did. Uh, it also named who uh, required that states name who is mandated to report maltreatment. Who? Physicians, teachers, who? We're gonna talk more about this a little bit later, but the states were required to name mandated reporters, okay? So, another requirement of CAPTA. And then, finally, uh, the states were uh, required to keep track of maltreatment and report to the federal government. This is hugely important because we can't know how much of a problem child maltreatment is if we don't collect the data. And at that point, you know, states had very different ways. Some states, most states, didn't collect any data at all. I can assure you that Wyoming would have been one of them. And so what CAPTA did was it required the states to finally keep track and then to report yearly so that we could see how much of a problem this is in our country. Okay, it took us 100 years to get from Etta Wheeler, 1874, to 1974 to CAPTA. But these are the rules that we're working with now. These are the laws that we're working with now. We've constructed, um, socially constructed this as a problem, from a condition to a problem. And much of what we're gonna be talking about in this class now then has been established in 1974. There are lots of changes that have happened since then and states do things differently as you're going to see. But we have the bones now uh, to understand what the law requires um, us to do with regard to child maltreatment. Okay, so next time we'll, we'll uh, pick up the discussion by talking about risk factors and what kinds of things uh, put families at risk for maltreatment. Okay, thanks.